All right, good morning, everybody. I am Anthony Maldonado, the program's coordinator here at the Corona Chamber. And I just wanna welcome you all to today's uh, business briefing. Uh, for those watching at a later time on our YouTube channel, please subscribe and stay up to date with all the latest legislative information from the Corona Chamber of Commerce. So we're gonna go ahead and kick the briefing off. And I would like to introduce our legislative action chair for this year, Jeff Miller. He is a former mayor, council member, and state assembly member. He does a really great job breaking down things from all points of view and is extremely knowledgeable about all things legislation. Um, and we are really thrilled to have him on these calls each and every week. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jeff Miller. Thank you, Anthony. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everyone who uh, is watching on YouTube. Uh, we uh, we had a couple weeks off due to the the Washington D.C. trip, so we're anxious to get things going again. And we've got a great uh, update on uh, the D.C. trip, on the meetings that were held. It was very very successful. Um, today's sponsorship is uh, by the County of Riverside. Riverside is the fourth largest county in California. It covers more than 7,300 square miles and is home to 2.4 million residents. It has earned a reputation as one of the nation's best places to work or start a business. In fact, 98% of businesses in Riverside County have fewer than 100 employees. Thank you, Riverside County, for sponsoring this meeting. I can't think of a better place to put your money. So uh, with that, there's a uh, chat button on the bottom. If you want to um, uh, ask any questions, feel free to use that chat button. And now I will throw it back to Anthony for um, chamber updates. Thank you so much, Jeff. And we have some really, really exciting uh, events coming up here at the Chamber. And one of the events that I want to touch on, just one of them today, is our Coffee with an Entrepreneur program coming up on just, or October 6th. I'm sorry about that. I'm skipping all the way to December. Um, but yes, October 6th is our next Coffee with an Entrepreneur program featuring the incredible Lonnie and Mary Scott. Um, Lonnie and Mary are the owners of Bobcat Properties Farm in the foothills of Corona. And you have no doubt seen them at the local farmer's markets selling their award-winning honey. But now's your chance to hear the story of not only how they got started, but how they have been able to sustain their business and keep growing. So register now by cl clicking the link that I'm going to put in the chat. And I just wanted to give another little heads up. I, I uh, said that I skipped ahead to December and we actually just scheduled our December Coffee with an Entrepreneur. And I will give you a hint, um, it is the happiest hour. So um, ponder on that and we will see you next Thursday, October 6th. Back to you, Jeff. Great, uh, thank you, Anthony. Okay, let's get right into it. Uh, I'd like to introduce our political consultant, uh, Jeff Gibson from Occidental Communications Group. Uh, Jeff, for over 35 years, has specialized in, in areas of political campaigns, um, government relations, government affairs. He has specialized in areas um, relating to the environment and transportation and housing, um, just to name a few, and was the author of uh, Jessica's Law back in 2006. Uh, with that, I'd introduce, I'd like to hand it off to Jeff Gibson. Thank you, Jeff, I appreciate that. So uh, we had an extremely productive uh, set of meetings in um, Washington, D.C. over the course of, of uh, th basically uh, three days. So we met with uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein, five senior members of Senator Dianne Feinstein's staff. Uh, we and uh, uh, met with uh, Representative Ken Calvert and uh, Mark Takano, and we'll get into that shortly. But I wanted to get into to what is not receiving enough information, but is going to definitely affect uh, the way that we move forward in the new year. Uh, in Sacramento. So, so Sacramento has now reported that, uh, um, as you can see on the, uh, with these charts, 
So the first part of this is that a huge amount of revenue comes from a number of different spots. So what you can see here is that income tax, you can see uh, all manner of, of uh, uh, all the taxes that are collected and that you can see the green sliver and that what that green sliver is, is the uh, amount of income tax that is, or the amount of, of general fund taxes that come from property tax. So when you hear that the state is in the, is in the uh, dire condition that it is in, which is you're going to be hearing a lot of uh, because of Prop 13, you can now look at this and say, well, in reality, obviously Prop 13 has a, plays a very, very small role in the $200 billion that are collected at any given time. On top of it, when you hear from Prop 30, which we've already opposed, that the top 1% are not paying their fair share, which you can see here in the first, in the, uh, first chart on your left, the bar chart on your left, you can see that uh, California's property income, uh, personal income tax is highly progressive in that the top 1%, which there's a, a historic um, opportunity for Californians like all of us to raise that property, that, that personal income tax by four points uh, on the November ballot. Uh, it's a uh, in Prop 30, something that's so radical that even the that uh, there's bipartisan. Uh, uh, both parties are asking for a no vote on that. Uh, the top one percent uh, of personal income taxpayers in California pay nine point eight percent of the personal income tax. The next four percent pay four point or five point six. The next 15% pay 3.8. And so what you're looking at there are the top 20% of income earners in the state of California who pay personal income tax, uh, pay uh, well over 20, uh, just about 20% of the income tax in the state. And that when you're looking at the lowest 20%, they actually uh, pay uh, seven tenths of, a, they actually are given seven tenths of a point uh, through the personal income tax systems or earned income tax credit or et cetera. And that the, low, the lowest 60% of earners pay, and actually the lowest 80% of earners pay less than 5% of, of the taxes that are collected in the state of California. So you're talking about the state is highly, highly leveraged on uh, very successful uh, people. And so when you look at this and you see that the personal income tax on the next slide or the next graph, the, the donut graph here, that the personal inc income tax sales and use tax and corporate tax provide 95% of the $178.8 billion uh, from the budget from last year. The current budget is well over $200 billion. So this slide still applies. You can see that the personal income tax is almost 70%, 69%. So of that 69%, well over half of that comes from people that earn more than $400,000 a year. So what you're, so now you say, okay, well, that seems like we're really relying on the top of the income pyramid to provide a huge amount of taxes to us. We know that a lot of that income comes from passive income sources like the sale of real estate, the sale of in investment vehicles, the collection of, of um, one-time taxes. So what is that doing to our surplus? Well, when the governor turned in the May, the, his May revised, basically final draft of the surplus, the surplus stood, if you remember, there was dancing in the streets when the surplus was at $120 billion. Uh, and wisely, the governor was saying, well, that might change. And so we need to only be investing as much as we can in one-time uh, programs on an ongoing basis. The legislature uh, had a number of different fights with them over that. By the time the legislature passed, the, and at the time we said that the, the governor should be even more conservative than he was being with the state finances because the, the numbers were changing rapidly. 
if you remember, we were saying the numbers were changing rapidly. So we want to underline that. After going through the emergency ener energy buys, the 25 billion that we spent uh, to give PG&E uh, 50 years of profit ahead of time so that they could they would keep Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant open, the coal, uh, uh, the uh, large scale coal energy um, uh, contracts that we've entered into with the state of Texas and several other states uh, with pr producers in those states. Uh, what you're looking at now is in, Ju in July, based upon forward going numbers on the first in the first month of the current fiscal year, the surplus stood at $77 billion. And if you remember, I was making jokes about 77 seems a lot different than 120. Well, by the time the legislature uh, was complete in August, the actual state surplus, and this was after a number of items were spent. Uh, so part of it was a drawdown of the numbers that were being spent on things like Diablo Canyon and the emergency coal uh, uh, purchases. That number was below $25 billion, still a very large number but substantially different, almost $100 billion different from the beginning of the, uh, just a, from just in May. Well, now fast forward and the first income tax collection numbers are coming in from, uh, uh, for the fiscal year from the month of August. And we are already $9.2 billion behind. We were supposed to have income tax collections year over year from August 2021 to August 2022, be five billion, grow by five billion dollars. And you can say, well, there are economic changes. Does that really change everything? All of the figures I'm giving you now are what all of the funding is predicated on for 2022, 2023. So what we're looking at now is a structural deficit we are going to be running into having to use our rainy day funds, which are largely paper savings. It's nice to have them, but it's difficult to access them because they're paper savings like people we didn't hire or expenses that we were uh, laying off on others. It's not, we don't have $23 billion in the bank for shortfalls. And the shortfall is now $9.2 billion because as we sit here today, we did not have uh, August or September uh, grow by $5 billion as was expected. It actually shrank by $4.2 billion, leaving us with a hole of $9.2 billion. So the, again, we were counting on growth. What we received was, was a large scale shrinkage. So we had already spent the $5 billion that we were expecting to grow by, of which none of that, it, that not only uh, did not appear, but then 4.2 billion extra dollars were not paid into uh, state coffers. And that's where the $9.2 billion uh, shortfall comes in. Now we do have cash to pay for that, but obviously, that cash runs runs out very quickly. If we're sitting as we're sitting here in, at the end of September, we if we were to utilize our rainy day funds to cover that shortfall, we would have fourteen billion dollars left in the rainy day fund. Uh, so burning through nine point two billion dollars in cash every six weeks is probably not going to end well for us by next June. So uh, uh, happy to take any questions that you may have, and then we'll move on to the next slide. Thank you, Jeff. Um, we did have one question or comment that came in, and um, in terms of media coverage, uh, do you happen to know what type of coverage this is getting? And uh, is this an opportunity for us to connect with Cal Chamber and kind of get some editorials out there statewide? It's received uh, large scale coverage in the Sacramento Bee, the uh, uh, several different several different websites. I got this from the California Budget and Policy Center. Uh, it, this has been receiving a, a, a good deal of press coverage. The governor has been uh, it, vetoing legislation based on the fact, uh, in fact, that the coverage 
that the governor is getting over uh, vetoing almost all spending bills is because uh, he's referencing this problem specifically. So yes, that would definitely be something that, uh, and we can we can pursue that uh, offline and report back. But yeah, this is this is definitely receiving a lot of information. Thank you, Jeff. No further questions, so we can continue. All right. So going on to the next one. So looking at at uh, the climate update. So the climate figures are in on California's um, climate change policy of eliminating the in, the internal combustion engine by 2035. And as a uh, as an update, uh, these numbers are from the EPA, as reported in the Wall Street Journal. Um, so uh, Levi Stadium in Santa Clara is the most energy intensive stadium. And again, Santa Clara being in California and Santa Clara being the hometown of uh, a number of, of statewide officials that uh, are also San Francisco 49ers fans. So you would think uh, you might raise an eyebrow to think that Levi Stadium is the most energy intensive stadium ever produced anywhere in the world. Uh, but it is, and on game day, it uses 350 kilowatt hours, and uh, for all of all of its operations. And so now you ask yourself, okay, that's very interesting. That seems like a lot of this seems like a lot of energy. Uh, that's essentially eight peaker plants worth of energy uh, uh, running throughout throughout a day. So what does one long haul truck of the tens of thousands that run every single hour statewide, what would one long haul truck be required to have as a charge to complete essentially a 1000 mile long trip, which is not unusual when you're thinking about uh, a vehicle being used 12 to 14 to 15 hours a day with multiple drivers uh, throughout Southern California and uh, or throughout California. And the energy needed for just one would be 350 kilowatt hours times 30. That would be every day uh, times roughly 50,000 vehicles charging at that amount. And that's just to stay precisely where we are. If our growth predictions um, come, come true, now you're going to be adding to that. All of this would have to be produced, would have to be energy that would be produced uh, above and beyond where we are as a grid right now. And when you think about what the grid is built for, the grid runs within 98 to 101% of capacity each and every day. And so what you're looking at there is a serious amount of grid capacity that will have to be added on top of the large scale, uh, almost unprecedented amount of energy produced uh, in, in and around the state of California. Uh, and so this is a very serious issue. We're going to be continuing to uh, participate uh, on it in the discussion of it and uh, happy to discuss it with you. Thank you, Jeff. If anybody has any questions. There are no questions at this time. Okay, so moving on to the last slide and going through uh, three of our top line meetings. We had great meetings with our officials, met with Senator Dianne Feinstein's office for the better part of, of an hour. Uh, she had five of her key policy staff we discussed a number of issues of economic issues, of regulatory issues, uh, waters of the U.S. Uh, just so that everyone understands what waters of the U.S. Uh, deals with. Uh, waters of the U.S. is a uh, uh, EPA regulation that, as proposed, gives the federal government the sole jurisdiction over any body of water uh, as large as what would. Um, accumulate on a sidewalk or a uh, in a gutter uh, if you had a leaky sprinkler. 
And I am not joking. And so uh, that is currently proposed by the uh, administration. And it's something that we are working very hard uh, because there's a great deal of water that's used uh, in construction, in mining. Uh, you, we all on this call probably don't contemplate mining uh, in Corona every day, but it is one of the largest job producers uh, in, uh, within the city. And it's a huge pr uh, producer of sales tax income. Uh, and it largely just exists way over in the corner of the city. So, um, so that's extremely important to us. Uh, we spent the better part of the afternoon with uh, Representative Calvert, went over a number of different items from Prado Dam uh, through the 90, 91 and 15 uh, construction projects and those that are upcoming. Had a great discussion with him. And then also met uh, uh, with uh, uh, Representative Mark Takano personally, had a, a very productive meeting with him discussing Riverside National Cemetery and uh, some of the upcoming memorials there and his and support that we need, along with job development, RCCD, and uh, the community college district, and many other issues. Um, so happy to discuss those. We met with uh, Representative uh, Daryl Issa's staff as well to discuss infrastructure funding on the, the uh, further infrastructure funding for the 9115 and the rest of Riverside County's in infrastructure requests. Uh, so, uh, but happy to uh, answer any questions that you may have. In addition, we met with uh, several policy experts from the Heritage Foundation um, uh, and researchers from uh, across the political spectrum on a number of different issues. So I, I think it was uh, National Federation of Independent Business and, ver and uh, various others. So happy to, to have anybody who was on the trip who might be on the call, discuss their perspective on it or uh, answer any questions that, that uh, folks may have. Hi, Jeff. This is Mike Korashi. How are you? Doing well. How are you? Good, good, good. Well, I, I'm, I apologize if I missed that. We also later rethought the Tomb of Unknown Soldiers, and I think that was a very good event. Yes, yes, that, yes. On, on, on Sunday, uh, Paul Bender and uh, Jim Gore um, laid a memorial wreath at the uh, Tomb of the Unknown, and it was, it was an excellent opportunity uh, to, to honor those that have given the last full measure of devotion to our freedom. So yes, thank you for, uh, for reminding me of that. Mike. It was amazing. It was amazing. Yeah. And thank you, Jeff, for putting that all together. I know that was hard work and the whole trip just came along flawless as usual. Oh. Enjoyed it. Oh. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. Uh, any, any, any question, any questions or comments, Anthony? So we did have uh, two questions. The first one is, did we meet with Senator Alex Padilla? Uh, no, no, we did not. We worked uh, very closely with, with uh, Senator Padilla, but at the moment, uh, actually right at the time we were going to be meeting with him, uh, they decided uh, that they were not taking in-person meetings because of, of COVID. We had in-person meetings all over the Hill and uh, his office is the last one that does not, uh, that decided that they weren't going to be doing in-person meetings, but we worked very closely with his office. Thank you, Jeff. And the next question is, can you be more specific about the college discussion? The college discussion uh, was around uh, the very generous gift uh, from uh, Jan Steiner and uh, to the printing office and how that would help uh, with uh, job development. Uh, and and uh, what the college was was doing to arrange uh, for a, a brand new uh, uh, print program, and that there were a couple of issues dealing with taxation and some other some other items uh, that uh, both that the the Congress the uh, our two uh, house or actually our three house offices that we met with Calvert Tucano and ISA were interested in discussing. We discussed it as well with uh, Senator Feinstein. Um, but we, we went into that in pretty fine comb detail of, of what can be, what could be made available and then their, their general support for workforce development through the college. 
Thank you again, Jeff. There are no further questions. All right. There we go. Thank you, Thank you guys. Thank you very much. And that um, if you want any additional information on the college meetings and what Jeff referenced, uh, just let us know. We'll reach out to you and you know personally and and uh, answer any specific questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. Yeah. Um, I'd like to go to, um, oh, well, let's go. Thank you, Jeff, again. Let's uh, put up the next slide. If you have any questions of our, our state representatives, uh, there's the contact information for Assembly Member Sabrina Cervantes um, and our Senator Richard Roth. And uh, before we wrap things up, I always like to go to Corona Regional Medical Center. Uh, does Linda have any updates or information that might be pertinent? You know, everything is good at Corona Regional. Our COVID numbers are down and are, are staying down. So that's a good thing. Uh, good news that we no longer have to ask for COVID vaccine verification when you come to visit. So that's effective this week. So we're excited about that too. So all good at Corona Regional. Fantastic. Thank you, Linda. Um, with that, I'd like to thank a few folks that are on the call before we wrap up. Uh, I'd like to thank Annette Dumont from the Riverside County Office of Education. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank uh, the Dean of Cal Baptist Business School, Tim Gramling, Dr. Tim Gramling. Uh, thank you, Tim. And uh, former mayor, former council member, Jason Scott is on the call. Thank you, Jason, for participating. We are uh, right on schedule. If anybody has any comments or suggestions or ideas, feel free to, I'll give you one last shot to get them out there. Um, otherwise, we will, uh, we will adjourn the meeting. So, all right. Any, Anthony, anything there? Nothing at all. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be seeing you next week, October 5th, Friday, um, Wednesday at 10 a.m. Uh, looking forward to seeing you there. Have a great week, everybody. You too, Jeff. Bye.